Hello. This video gathers together the scientific data on the spread of the new coronavirus variants. The video will cover what these three new variants are and will focus mostly on the story of the B117 variant that was discovered and has spread in the UK. We'll look at what can be expected in other countries where this variant is present and we'll also look at what is known so far about the other variants that have been identified in South Africa and Brazil. If you're not a scientist then you should be able to follow this presentation but you may find things like PCR, the difference between DNA and RNA, how mutations um, in the DNA and RNA can affect proteins and therefore affect the virus might be confusing to you. Um, so I highly recommend that you watch uh, a video we posted recently which explains in simple terms um, the characteristics of the virus, how the PCR tests are run, um, what DNA, RNA are and how they code for proteins and how you get mutations. Um, it, it's um, a very useful video for non-scientists. So what are these three new variants? So they're called variants of concern because they carry a lot of mutations and those mutations are known to improve the fitness of the coronavirus. The first of these was identified in the United Kingdom, uh, specifically in the southeast of England, and this variant is called B117. Now, for different reasons, there, there are different uh, nomenclature um, used to classify coronaviruses. So it's also called 20I501Y version 1, and it's also called Variant of Concern 2020 December number one. This strain has, unlike other mutations that appear very frequently in the coronavirus all around the world where you get a small number of mutations over time, this particular variant accumulated a large number of mutations all in one go. And some of those mutations are really known to improve viral fitness and I'll get into those later. The variant from South Africa is called B1351, and it's also got another name. And it also has a cluster of mutations, particularly in the spike protein of the coronavirus. And some of those mutations, at least this one, overlaps the one found in the UK variant. And finally, most recently, uh, a new variant has been identified in Brazil, and it's been given the name P1. And it also has a very large number of mutations in the spike protein, including the two that concern us about the South Africa variant, and one of those is overlaps with the UK variant. Other mutations found in these strains showed that they evolved independently in these three different parts of the world. So it's not the same virus that's uh, appeared uh, and, and spread to these three countries. These are three different um, incidences of these mutations being acquired by the virus. And the fact that some of these mutations are shared between the virus is an example of uh, convergent evolution. Um, it's very well known that when a virus managed to jump a species, it then spends some time adapting to its new host. So this is entirely expected the virus is, is adapting and, and finding better ways of infecting and spreading amongst the human population. Most variation of SARS-CoV-2 globally has been at a rate of about two amino acid changes per month. So to see such a large number of mutations all in one go is very unusual. And they've, all three variants have probably uh, arose, the theory is that they've um, arose in chronically infected individuals. So these are people who've got COVID and they are not clearing it. So obviously they're still alive, but they may have this infection for very many weeks, maybe a few months. And this allows time for the virus to reinfect that person. And so it slowly acquires more and more mutations. 
and it may well be that the mutations that help the virus to infect cells better allows that virus to escape the immune system in that person. So slowly over time the virus just gets better at escaping the immune system through infecting cells better and you end up with these um, new variants. So as I said we're going to focus mostly on the B117 variant um, that was identified in the UK on the 20th of September 2020 and we're going to go through all these different things um, in some detail so to help you understand what we know about the strain. So firstly I'm going to talk about how the UK does its COVID-19 testing um, because one of those tests allows us to look at the spread of this variant. Um, we'll look at that spread across the UK and how quickly it's happened and then we'll look at the evidence which implies that this variant is more transmissible than previous strains or in other words it spreads more quickly than the strains we've been living with throughout 2020. I will then um, discuss why increased transmission rates are so dangerous and are more dangerous than mutations that might make the virus more deadly. Uh, we'll look at evidence that more people do become infected with this variant. Um, so that's very important. It's not just models, it's actual um, real outcomes. And we'll look at evidence that uh, patients with B117 might produce more virus. And that might contribute to why it's spreading so much. If people are making more virus, there's a greater chance of them infecting the next person. And then finally, I'll look at the spread of, the of this variant beyond the UK. So the UK COVID-19 testing system occurs in four pillars, as it's called. The first pillar is the kind of test that would happen in a hospital. And the tests are done by uh, the UK's uh, free at the point of care National Health Service. Pillar two is community testing. So that's the kind of thing where people get symptoms and they'll call up the doctor, they'll book a test, get a test done, or they've been in close contact with somebody who's recently tested positive and they may go for, a, uh, go for a test themselves. And that's the vast majority of testing in the UK. All of the tests are, are free. Pillar three are antibody tests, which are much slower tests, and there are, there are not anywhere near as many of them. And then pillar four is surveillance testing run by a, a, a part of central government called the Office for National Statistics. And they're doing asymptomatic testing, so testing people who don't have any symptoms seeing what the positivity rate is there and then by comparing the numbers from their tests with the pillar two tests they can estimate how many people in the UK are positive for COVID-19 at any one time and they can do that by age and region. Pillar two is a commercial centralised system consisting of local drive-in, walk-in test sites um, and swabs are sent away for analysis um, to the lighthouse labs that are found around the country. Sorry for the typo there. So the lighthouse labs are found in Glasgow, uh, in Cheshire, Alderley Park, uh, in Milton Keynes, um, plus there's lots of other places uh, which are affiliated. So different universities like Birmingham and London universities also contribute to this whole system. Um, and I want to point out these three in particular, Glasgow, Alderley Park and Mil Milton Keynes, because they use um, a particular PCR assay called the TACPATH assay um, in their testing programs. And this shows something called S dropout, which I'm going to explain in a minute. So here we are. Um, so if you do not understand what I mean by PCR, you don't understand the difference between DNA and RNA and so on, again, please go and look at the other video from us, which introduces and explains in very clear plain terms to non-scientists what PCR, DNA, RNA etc are. But the whole point of the test is to try and identify the presence of three viral genes sequences um, in swabs taken from the back of your nose. And, and the sequences are here so there, there are primers and probes in this PCR assay that will identify the presence of this gene or F1 or the spike gene or the N gene here and if the PCR, uh, PCR assay works what you'll end up with is increasing amounts of DNA for each of these three genes 
and and the DNA uh, w will uh, as as it as it builds up will produce a colour. So one's green, one's yellow, one's red. And the PCR machine, as it's going through the cycles and making more and more DNA over time, you will eventually start to see an increase in the amount of red, green and yellow. And when they cross this particular line here called the threshold, that's the point at which you say, OK, yes, these genes were there. Now, if there was a lot of viral RNA present in the sample, a lot of virus, lots of viral RNA genome, then this PCR will happen much more quickly. So these curves will be will happen towards the left and the curves will cross this threshold line earlier. So you'll get a lower called it's called a CT number, a cycle cycle threshold number. So the lower the number, the more our RNA. If there wasn't very much RNA, then this reaction would occur much more slowly. It will cross the threshold later. So the CT numbers, the point at which these curves cross this, this line, is, is directly proportional to how much sample there was in the beginning, and it's a completely quantitative assay. Now, what has been found in the UK, uh, and this started happening in late 2020, was that the test for the spike protein was beginning to fail. And this is called S-dropout, sort of laboratory slang, or it's been called spike gene target failure, SGTF. Basically, this one of the three tests was failing, but the other two are still positive. And this is enough to still give a positive test. And the reason this was failing is because the new variant, B117, one of its mutations deletes two amino acids, 69 and 70. And the RNA bases encoding for those amino acids overlap one of the primer probes used in this assay. So this assay can all, so the gene is still there, the spike gene is still there, but it's different, it's been mutated. And it means this assay can no longer amplify it and detect it. So it appears to be missing. It's not missing, it's just mutant. So as I said, these um, PCR tests were showing this S dropout um, in late 2020. Uh, and I'll explain to you why that's happening. So this is the result of PCR tests across England and different regions of England showing the ratio of all positive tests, what ratio of them um, has this S gene target failure. So in other words, might be this B117 variant. And you can see that during November and through December, and it started first in the southeast, London, and then the east of England, and then has begun to, uh, to spread to other parts of England, uh, you can see that the ratio of positive tests that had an S dropout kept increasing and increasing to the point where almost all of them now are this S dropout. So after the PCR tests have been done, scientists have then gathered together those PCR samples and then done genome sequencing for the coronavirus genome. And, and then they identified that actually more than 99% of tests which have this S gene failure are actually the B117 variant. So this is really useful for the UK because it means that the PCR test, which is um, performed incredibly frequently, um, it, you get a result in a day. It, it's a good proxy test, a proxy assay to identify where this variant is and where it's spreading in real time. Whereas genome sequencing, you, you tend to have to wait one to two weeks before all the results come back and once it's all been analysed. So, the labs which use the TACPATH assay will be able to use the PCR test to quickly monitor the spread of this variant B117. And that's what's happening in the UK. Um, other countries could do this as well if they use this particular assay. If they use a different assay, then they won't get this result. Um, and also, the test is not um, the, the, the S gene target failure is not necessarily because of this variant because there are some other variants which aren't very prevalent that also have that deletion 6970 in. So Denmark in particular had a different variant that had that same deletion. So they might not be able to use this assay quite so easily uh, to monitor the spread of this new fast spreading variant. 
So we can look at the cases of COVID-19 across the UK and we can see in summer the rates have come down quite low. But then as people went away in Europe and went on their summer holidays and then came back, they brought back with them some slightly faster spreading strains and that led to an increase in COVID-19 cases across England, particularly the North and the Midlands. And that then led to a lockdown um, uh, of, of social um, distancing restrictions across England for four weeks uh, through November. And that enabled the cases to be brought down quite successfully. But if you notice in the southeast, the cases didn't come down. And then as we carry on into December, the cases rapidly grow in Kent and then in London, the east of England, and then it spreads across the rest of England. So those are very rapid spread in cases, even though we had this lockdown. One of the um, details of the data that was seen quite early on was that it seemed to be that children um, and, and school aged children in particular um, might be getting infected with this variant more preferentially over any other variant compared to other age groups. Uh, and as time's gone on now, a few weeks have gone by, uh, so this is all of the data comparing what ages of people and what sexes of people were getting the previous variant versus the new variant, and it all seems to have leveled out. It, it does seem that we have the same distribution of COVID-19 infections across all age groups um, and, and the sexes. So we, we, do, we don't think anything new is happening in children specifically. But what is happening is that there um, is an increase in the spread across all regions of the UK. So, so this slide um, looks at how scientists known as epidemiologists look carefully at COVID-19 cases across different populations and look at all the factors that could influence those cases. They use different approaches to understand past spread and project what is most likely to happen in the coming weeks. Um, they've compared the growth in cases of the new B117 variant uh, and the older variants within the same populations and that's enabled the researchers to control for other factors that can affect the rates of transmission, such as different levels of social distancing. The researchers also tested different mathematical models and used genomic sequencing or PCR data to build their models. Each analysis consistently showed a strong increase in the reproduction number of between 0.4 and 0.7. In other words, the variant does appear to be 40 to 70% um, more transmissible than previous variants in the UK. So just to explain what, what, what we're seeing here, basically these, are, these points are, are the sort of replication rates of the previous variant or the new variant within the same population of people but it's been separated out into different data sets. So separated out either by region of England, uh, by the week of the, the data was collected, and then um, also the size of, so the colors are the regions, the different symbols of the different weeks. And then the size of the symbols relates to what fraction um, of those cases were the new variant at that time. So you can see that pretty much everything is above this line here. So in other words, this B117 variant is replicated quicker than previous variants. I don't think there can be any doubt about that. There's no doubt that this virus is spreading far more quickly. The, the issue is, is how fast. Um, and you can see that the data sets that where, where there, were, there was more cases, a higher ratio of the, the, the new variant than the difference from the previous variant is much greater. Okay, so these mathematical models predict 40 to 70% faster spread of this variant um, across England. So why are more transmissible variants more dangerous than variants which might be more lethal? So this is a, a hypothetical scenario uh, I've got drawn up here. 
And um, this idea was created by Adam Kacharsky, who's an epidemiologist at London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine. And the idea is that, that we're starting here with 10,000 cases. And we calculate what's going to happen in terms of cases and deaths over time. So with the original variant, we can suggest that the strain that we're currently dealing with, the variant we're currently dealing with, has a death rate of 0.8%. And its infection rate, or, or R rate if you like, is 1.1. So it's increasing by 1.1 every time point here. And this time point might be a week, it, it, it doesn't matter. So cases grow steadily over time and 0.8% of them are leading to deaths. So the deaths gradually increase as the cases gradually increase. If we had a 50% more lethal variant, so mutations somehow led to more deaths in hospitals, so the death rate now goes up to 1.2%, then we simply just double the number of deaths. The number of cases is still the same. We're just doubling the number of deaths and these deaths gradually increase over time. But if we just have the same kind of virus, the same kind of disease, the death rate is the same at 0.8%, but a new variant of the virus is able to infect people more quickly and reproduce through the population more quickly because of this increased transmission rate. So we increase that by 50%, so now the R is 1.65 then what we end up with is many, many more cases. And from that, we end up with many, many more deaths. So in just a few weeks' time, we've got many more deaths compared to what we had before. And our health care system gets inundated as well. So more transmissible variants are the ones to be the most concerned about. So there were key findings um, at, at the end of this report from the epidemiologist who, who calculated this faster transmission rate. And they pointed out that the majority of the data that they were using was from November 2020, when there was a high level of social distancing in England. There was a lockdown in place. So this, this strain has been able to spread despite a lockdown. So they've concluded that while the strict social distancing measures were sufficient to contain previous coronavirus strains, they're actually insufficient to control the B117 variant, and, and that's very troubling. So what did the UK lockdown look like in November 2020? So many of the viewers will not be from the UK, uh, and, and you'll be wondering uh, how it compares to your own social distancing measures. So in November 2020, um, all leisure was closed, so pubs and restaurants were closed, um, takeaways were still permitted, um, non-essential shops uh, and leisure and entertainment venues all closed, so uh, only things like food shopping and, and medicines were open. Uh, and there was no mixing between households indoors, so you couldn't go see your friends and family members who lived in other homes. You couldn't go meet them in private gardens, uh, and the exceptions were if you were supporting somebody um, elderly or, or unwell. Uh, you were told to stay home and only leave for specific reasons, such as going shopping for food and medicine, uh, or maybe it's education or work that couldn't be done at home. And that was a key thing, uh, this sort of loose definition of uh, what work um, could be done outside of the home. Um, importantly, schools, colleges and universities remained open. Uh, outdoor recreation was encouraged, so you could go for a run and go for a walk, um, and you could meet one person outside of your household, so you could go for a walk with a friend. So there were still opportunities for the virus to jump between households. So we've seen the model, uh, the models, and they project a, a 40 to 70 percent increase in the reproduction of this new variant. Um, so did this, does this lead to more cases? So 
the NHS in the UK and I should make clear that the, the different countries in the UK have um, operate their own health service and have slightly different systems. So this is English data I'm going to refer to here from their test and trace scheme. Um, and this will indicate how the new variant spreads across regions and age groups. So the NHS England test and trace um, contacts people who've tested positive for COVID-19, interviews them and asks them who they've been in direct contact with and who they've been in close contact with. And then the test and trace team then go to try and contact those people um, and it, they may do some testing on them, but it, certainly they, they will at least follow the progress um, of those contacts. And so we have data for the fraction of contacts um, of people who tested positive for COVID-19, how many of them go on themselves um, to become positive for COVID-19. And this is something called a secondary attack rate. Um, so a very aggressive sounding term, attack rate. But what fraction of people who've been in contact with someone who's tested positive get positive themselves? Um, I should point out that everybody in the UK who has COVID-19 symptoms, even before they get a positive result, and certainly after a positive result, are expected to self-isolate for 14 days. So this should greatly reduce this attack rate. So all of this data um, and that you're going to see comes despite the fact of a lockdown and this rule that everybody should be self-isolating. Um, so this data is made is made publicly available and it's broken down by UK region, age group, um, whether the variant, whether it's the B one one seven variant involved in the infections or whether it's a previous variant. So there are two point four million confirmed COVID cases in the UK to date, at least when this report came out, and test and trace data is available for almost a million people. So here's this almost a million people, and you can see it's broken down by region, uh, whether contact was direct or close. So direct means you're literally in um, skin skin contact. So these are people you're in a relationship with, parents, children, um, pe uh, people with, their, with carers. So people you're within one meter of or in skin contact with, that's a direct contact. Um, a close contact is someone who you've followed the rules and tried to keep um, social distancing uh, from, um, but you've spent a prolonged period of time with them. So there might be somebody you've gone for a walk with or exercised with, um, sat across a table from uh, at a meal or had a coffee with, uh, someone you work with, someone uh, in, your, in your class at school or college. And then it's broken down by age group as well. So this is what the data looks like for the previous variants, the 2020 variants. So on average, um, across the regions, 11% of contacts of people who were po who tested positive went on themselves to get COVID-19 positive. And clearly that rate is highest with direct contacts versus close contacts. There are differences between age groups. So adults on average are about 15% um, attack rate. So 15% of contacts become infected. And the rates in children um, are considerably lower. Um, but what you have to bear in mind is, is it's known that children have um, fewer symptoms than adults. The severity of their illness is, is much lower. Um, and so they may not know that they're positive, they may be asymptomatic, or their symptoms are so mild that they, they don't say anything, and so they don't get tested. So there may be some under-reporting going on, or it may well be children are just genuinely less susceptible to infection. So the data with the new B117 variant, so in other words, these are tests where there was this S gene target failure, are quite different. So on average, 15% of contacts now uh, go on to test positive for the new variant. Um, this goes up to 20% amongst adults, but you can see even children, the rates of 
um, secondary attack increase, the rates of um, contact infection um, increase with this new variant. Um, even if um, you've tried to keep social distancing and you're defined as a close contact, um, this variant is more likely to spread between close contacts. So if we compare the attack rates between the original strains and the new strain, then you can see all of them are up between 30 and 50%. So this is actually what's happened in people as opposed to a model, and the numbers are very similar. So averaging it out to be around 40% more transmissible, 40% more infectious. It's notable that the biggest change, the biggest in increase was uh, probably in children, uh, where it's a slightly higher increase. So the key, here are the sort of key take home numbers from that very big table of data. Mm -hmm. So the attack rate of the previous variants was 11% on average across all regions of England and the regions all seem to behave very similar to each other and the new variant the attack rate has gone up to 15% so 11 versus 15 and then we can compare what's happening in children so uh, younger children primary school age children before one in 16 children were getting infected if, if, a, if a contact was positive that's increased to one in 11 for secondary school children and college age students, it was 1 in 11. That's gone up to 1 in 8 with the new variant. And for adults, it was over 1 in 7. Now it's 1 in 5. So overall, there's a 40% increase in the likelihood of getting infected when you've been in contact with somebody who's infected. Okay. So... I've pointed out the biggest increase was in the uh, young child age group um, and a key point also is that the attack rate in secondary school age children uh, with the new variant at 12% is now higher than the overall average of 11% with the previous strains. So children in school are more likely to pass it on now than what adults were with the previous strains. So a lot of people have been questioning whether schools or colleges are safe to open when such a faster spreading virus variant is so prevalent. So this is data from the UK Office for National Statistics, which as I mentioned earlier, uh, models the percentage of the population testing positive for COVID-19 and they could stratify this by region and by age. So this is their data that I've plotted out. So what we're looking at here with each graph is uh, groups of people who um, uh, groups of the population by age. So either age 2 to 11 years, so these are the primary school years in the UK or ages 11 to 16, so this is secondary school children. And then we've got young people, so people in college, university, young people at work. And then we've got adults in the 20s through to 30s, uh, going through to the middle ages and then to the elderly. And what we can see, and so to, to, to remind you, the, the UK national lockdown took place during November 2020. And it ended on the 6th of December. So we can see a dip, a downward trend in all of these plots um, at that time that the, the lockdown was having some effect. But following the release of the lockdown, and remember children were still in school during that lockdown, um, the coronavirus was increasing in primary age children and increasing very quickly in secondary age children. And the increase in secondary age children began before the lockdown finished and no other group shows that younger adults it was falling at that time older adults it was falling or flatline at that time so while the infection of children clearly depends on the amount of the virus that's out in the wider community 
it, it's hard to imagine that some of the, what we're seeing here is not because of in-school um, infections. And by um, the end of the school term, and certainly by the Christmas period, the group with the most uh, infections in England was secondary school children, where it was thought nearly 4% of the population was infected at that time, and the rates were considerably lower in other age groups. It's important to point out that there's no clear evidence to date yet that the B117 strain spreads faster in children than, than in adults. The, the accelerated rate of, of, of spread is just affecting all age groups quite equally. Um, and the increased rate seen in children in December 2020 might relate to infection in the community and or in school settings. And any decision to close schools to control the pandemic should be used as a last resort. There's a very good report from the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, and it concluded that the negative physical, mental health and educational impacts caused by proactive school measures on children, uh, particularly more vulnerable children, were very substantial. And this is data collected from across Europe uh, during the lockdowns of March 2020 through to June 2020. Um, I should point out that there are, there are numbers in the corners of each of these slides. These are references you will find in the description to all the sources of information I've used for each of these slides. Um, it's likely that an increase in measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in schools and colleges is likely to be required in countries that have high levels of the B17 or the other um, new faster spreading strains. Um, these include mass asymptomatic testing, perhaps these fast laminar flow tests, uh, self-isolation of contacts, of people who've been in contact with somebody who's test positive, increased social distancing, smaller class sizes, staggered timetables, and so on. Um, now, this is a very emotive and, and complex issue. This is a very difficult decision for, uh, for lawmakers uh, to make in the coming weeks and months in different countries around the world facing up to these new faster spreading strains. Um, I recommend you look at the, the Twitter feed of Deepti Gosandi, who's a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University in London, um, who's been uh, really good at trying to explain uh, the data behind um, the spread going on in schools and some of the, the biases in the data sets and the models, and it's, it's quite a, a difficult thing um, to get your head around. So why is SARS-CoV-2, why is this variant B117 more transmissible than the previous um, coronavirus strains, um, variants? The spike protein mutation N501Y increases its ability to interact with ACE2. So this is something that's known from laboratory experiments. And ACE2 is the main receptor for the virus on human cells. So this mutation makes this strain more sticky. It's able to attach to our cells more quickly and that's going to increase its rate of infection into our cells. It's also known that this other mutation where amino acids 69 and 70 are deleted that also increases the infectivity um, of the of, um, viruses in laboratory experiments by twofold. Um, it's not quite um, known why it how it does this. This same mutation also removes a common neutralizing antibody site on the spike protein. So when we raise an immune response to these viruses, we make a set of antibodies called neutral ant neutralizing antibodies. And these are sort of like our first defense against the virus. They will bind to a virus, paint it up, and then immune cells will come along and um, destroy that virus. And so if the virus is taking away this, the, the protein sequence that the antibody binds to, um, then that's one less piece of the immune system that we can use. Um, this is known to impair the use of convalescent plasma units and sera 
recovered from COVID-19 patients. So people who've tested positive before and raised a strong antibody re response, we can purify their antibodies and give them to another patient. Well, uh, if you've got this uh, new variant, then some of those antibodies we're giving you actually won't do anything. So these mutations or others may increase the amount of virus produced by infected patients. And there's evidence that people infected with the B117 variant do indeed make more virus. So there's three bits of evidence here. So first of the UK New Emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group, or NERVTAG for short, reported that the PCR tests that were taking place in the UK um, which had the B117 variant in them, had a CT value in those tests that was uh, lower by two on average. And if you've watched my previous talk explaining PCR to you and how these um, quantitative PCR assays work, then uh, PCR, your uh, target product increases, it doubles with every cycle of the PCR. So if you've got a two cycle difference, uh, as, as the report in here, then that's two times two. In other words, a fourfold increase in your target was present in your sample when you started. So overall, they're saying there's fourfold more viral RNA across the country if they have this variant in them. But this um, smaller data set from the Birmingham UK Lighthouse Lab shows a very wide variation in the amount of viral RNA in the samples they were testing. Um, so you can see this spread here. So, so basically what they're doing is testing for the presence of either the off gene or the N gene. Um, and then it's split into left and, uh, left and right here by whether the, the spike gene test failed. In other words, this is the new variant on the left or the spike test worked. In other words, these are the older variants, so new variants and older variants. And you can see both of these genes give the same story. And if you take the median CT value for all these different patients here, there's a very big difference between them. And that equates to about 100 times more viral RNA on average uh, with people who've tested positive for the B117 variant. And, and for some individuals, it's 100,000 times more. So this is a very big difference. And then this is data here from the University of Oxford who um, are doing their genome sequencing on samples. And they found that we're getting more uh, um, genome sequencing reads when the samples tested positive um, for the, the new variant here, which is on the right compared to these two on the left. And they, cal they estimated that there was threefold more viral RNA um, in the, the samples they were looking at. So this raises the question, is the variant B117 more transmissible due to increased viral load because this virus just makes more viral particles? Well, not necessarily. Um, firstly, scientists still need to test for the amount of infectious viral particles using well-controlled experimental systems to prove this. Cells infected with the B117 variant might just simply be producing more genomes or fragments of genomes, and, and for whatever reason, it doesn't actually make more functional virus particles. You know, it's, it, it's a mutant and it's a bit of a mess kind of scenario. However, I think the scientific community and, my, and myself believe that there's just too much data here, uh, and, and it, it looks far more consistent with there being a higher viral load in patients that have been affected with the variant B117 compared to other variants and and it's likely that will turn out to be the story over time. Um, now you can think mechanistically how m might we get more viral RNA in a sample when we've got a new variant. Well one way is that the virus it's only so we we'll imagine scenarios here where there's only one of these four changes so one change might be the virus just infects more of the same cells. So it infects a greater proportion of the cells in your upper respiratory tract, for example. If each of those cells produced a certain amount of viral particles, the fact that there are more cells being infected means you are going to expel more viral particles and therefore be more infectious. Um, 
and therefore also have more viral RNA in your swab sample. And, and indeed, this virus does bind to cells more readily and does get into cells more quickly. So potentially it does indeed infect more cells. Another way is the virus might infect more types of cells. So this is called tropism. Um, the viruses are optimized to infect certain kinds of cells in your body. You know, they don't infect your skin cells, for example. Um, so if it's infecting more cell types, then again, that, that, those cells become more factories for making virus and you end up with more viral RNA. Um, alternatively, it's the, there's just a, an improved way of making the viral RNA genome in human cells that's been optimized in some way. Um, and this actually might lead to more viral particles being made, and so you end up with more viral RNA in the sample. Or alternatively, there are other things about making the virus physically and the, the structure and stability of all the proteins used by the virus has improved with these mutations and that goes to just make a better quality product per cell so the number of cells infected is still the same it's just that those cells now produce more infectious particles because the virus is just a better quality virus now so there's lots of ways of thinking about how these mutations could lead to more viral rna and in turn more viral load there's lots and lots of opportunities for viruses to to improve in their hosts so will other countries also have to deal with the variant B117? Well, the short answer is absolutely yes. So variant B117 has begun to uh, spread around the globe. Um, I believe 55 countries now have reported the presence of this variant in their testing programs. And 17 countries are, are reporting local transmission. Um, there's an excellent website that compares all the lineages and gives you updates on where they are in the world at the moment. Um, and this is largely built by uh, Anya O'Toole in Edinburgh. Um, so go check out her account on Twitter. And uh, one of the references here points to the, the covlineages.org um, website where this data is taken from. And I've drawn my own map. So there are a lot of countries where B117 is now present. It's had enough time um, to get on the plane and accumulate a lot of air miles. Many European countries, Israel and the USA, have growing numbers of cases. Um, it's worth pointing out that the rapid spread of B117 in the UK took place about two months after the first cases had been observed. Um, so I've, I've heard some call this the fuse. Um, so there's a period of time between the emergence of a variant and how long it takes to, to, to scale up and have enough opportunities, enough of these sort of super spreader events um, to seed itself in a population to the point where it now becomes uh, dominant in one area and, and then can spread through other populations. Um, and you know this is a process that's um, not very well understood uh, and it may well be the length of that fuse is different in different countries um, based on um, th their epidemiology so things like lockdown measures and restrictions uh, how dense populations are how frequent travel is between towns and cities and so on um, now, the UK's nearest neighbour, Ireland, is the first outside the UK to have a rapid upturn in B117 cases. Uh, and unfortunately, this may have been caused by Christmas, where uh, it was legal to have some mixing between households uh, um, to celebrate Christmas. Um, and the Irish love a party. Um, and unfortunately, Ireland's chief medical officer stated on January 11th, 2021, that the new variant accounted for 45% of tests uh, in that previous week, compared to 25 and 9% in one and two weeks prior to that. So it does like look like B117 has now got a foothold in Ireland, which has quite a large spike in cases at the moment. Now, if there's sufficiently large enough sampling of cases, genome sequencing can help track how fast a variant spreads in real time. So I've already talked about how 
the um, PCR test in the UK was very useful for tracking the spread of the variant in real time. But not everybody uses the same test. And if you've got other variants with that 6970 deletion in, you can't use a PCR test to track this B117 variant over other variants. And you have to do genome sequencing. So some countries do have sufficient amounts of genome sequencing. So the UK um, has a very high amount of genome sequencing. Denmark is also putting in a huge effort. And uh, as you would expect, the USA has a, a decent amount of genome sequencing as well. So these plots here, so um, all of these images are taken from uh, Trevor Bedford's um, Twitter account. Trevor is a, a researcher at the Fred Hutch Institute in, in, in Seattle. And this is a really nice analysis from Trevor here. So I couldn't help but put it in. So um, this is the number of uh, sequencing cases per day uh, in the UK. Denmark releases those, those every week. And then cases per day in the USA. And I think this is data is just restricted to the six states where the B117 variant is getting a foothold in the USA. So New York, California, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Maryland, and New Mexico. And so, so these are the amount of sequencing being done in gray. And then red, this is the number of sequences which turn out to be uh, B117 and, and the percentage of, of, the, of the tests being done at the time, the analysis of being, analyses being done at the time, what percentage are the variant. So you can see in the UK, the vast majority of genomes being sequenced now are B117. And we can see this uh, pretty rapid increase through November and December. In Denmark, this increase has, has now uh, begun in late December, but it's obviously at a much lower level than it is in the UK, but it's clearly on the rise. And the same story is happening in the US. It seems to have got a foothold in some places and is now on the rise. And one thing Trevor has done um, is, is done a sort of logistic growth rate analysis um, uh, and so fitted this analysis to the data. And, and he's able to show that there's a 40 to 50% increase in transmission of the B117 variant compared to the amount of genome sequencing of other variants in the same populations at the same time. So again, this is another piece of data giving a very similar result. Epidemiologists have predicted 40 to 70 percent. The uh, secondary attack rate uh, in the UK was coming out at 40 percent. The genome sequencing is saying 40 to 50 percent, all showing that the B17 uh, strain uh, variant is, is spreading through the population more quickly than previous variants and becoming dominant in the case of the UK. So what is known about the other variant, B11351, uh, that was found in South Africa? So this was first identified on the 8th of October 2020. I should point out one thing, that um, South Africans don't want this to be called the South African vi variant. The British don't want B117 to be called the British variant and the Brazilians don't want theirs to be called the Brazilian variant. We don't actually know um, where these variants have come from. It may well be they've come from another country uh, which doesn't have thorough testing and they've been imported in and they just get detected in these countries that have got the genome sequencing. This B11351 variant um, is calculated to be 50% more transmissible than previous local variants. And again, all the papers that are out there are, are linked in the corner here. This variant contains the spike mutation N501Y, which is known to help the virus stick to human cells more easily. It also contains two mutations that remove binding sites for neutralizing antibodies. And this is likely to weaken the immune response in some individuals and has definitely been shown to impair the use of convalescent plasma units in sera recovered from patients who previously tested positive for COVID-19. Um, there is evidence of higher viral load of, of this um, variant as well. So looking at some of the data, 
uh, again links in the corner so this variant uh, quickly became the predominant one found in genome sequencing in South African labs um, by mid-November 2020. Mid-November 2020 was the beginning of a large surge in cases of COVID-19 across South Africa. It's not known what fraction of these cases are due to this uh, B11351 variant yet, um, but the coincidence is not lost on researchers. And then looking at the PCR tests, uh, the South African labs are finding that uh, there is a 5 CT difference in the PCR tests when they are positive for this variant B11351, which has this other name here, compared to the other variants that already existed in South Africa at the time. So this is indicative of more than 30 times more viral RNA in these patient samples on average. Uh, so again, it's very likely that it's an increased viral load with this variant. This variant is also starting to accumulate some air miles. It has already um, spread across the globe. Um, there is local transmission taking place in Botswana uh, and Zambia. Um, there's local transmission also taking place in the UK and Belgium and the UK are hoping that they've got all their cases contained um, but we don't know that for sure and imported cases have also been found in Canada Ireland France Germany Holland Switzerland Austria Scandinavia China Japan Australia and New Zealand so the UK has got the most cases identified out of South Af outside of South Africa so far uh, it's hoped that they're contained but the likelihood is that countries that neighbour South Africa and have a lot of interaction with South Africa probably have higher levels of this variant that remain undetected uh, because of insufficient testing. So finally, the other variant that was recently identified is called P1. It's found in Brazil. It was first identified on the 16th of December 2020 in Manaus. Uh, which is a city in the Amazon region of Brazil. It's only known to be spreading in the Manaus region so far, uh, but imported cases have been found in Japan and Italy. 42% um, of the test samples collected in December uh, from Manaus turned out to be positive for this new P1 variant when they did the genome sequencing. So there are likely to be a very large number of cases in Manaus. Whether this variant has now spread beyond the region of Manaus and, and Amazonia and gone to other parts of Brazil or across the borders um, to other countries is unclear at this stage because often the genome sequencing capacity of, of, of these countries is quite low. And <clears throat> One important thing to point out is that there are two new strains in Brazil and uh, there's been a bit of crossed wires in some media reports um, because one's called P1 and one's called P2. So one of the most common lineages in Brazil uh, before uh, leading up to December 2020 was called B1128 and these new variants are descendants from that so they're new versions of, of this uh, lineage. P2 does contain an important mutation, this E484K, so you remember this is one of the mutations that takes away an antibody binding site, so um, it, you know it would get some attention anyway, but it doesn't have this huge number of mutations, this cluster of mutations in the spike protein and other genes that the P1 variant has, uh, and quite frankly we're not as worried about the, the P2 variant. The P2 variant is more widespread in Brazil. It's been found in Rio de Janeiro um, and it has been exported overseas and it's reached the UK and other countries. Um, but the main concern is with the new highly variant strain P1. Um, and so far it seems to be contained in Manaus, uh, but the odds are it's already on the move. Um, 
it's worth pointing out that the identification of these new variants in Manaus P1 and P2 um, coincided with a surge in COVID-19 cases in Brazil. The cases have gone ex extremely high over the last few weeks. Um, so again, we don't know what fraction of this surge in new cases is due to this these new variants. So in summary, all three of these coronavirus variants of concern contain clusters of mutations of the spike protein in particular. The UK and South African variants have both been characterized by faster transmission rates, escape from some neutralizing antibodies and higher viral loads. The P1 variant from recently identified in Brazil uh, carries the same key spike mutations as the South African and British variants and it's likely to behave in a similar way. B117 and B11351 have already begun to spread into other countries. They've left the UK, they've left South Africa and they are increasing elsewhere. The general consensus across the scientific community is that all existing vaccines are still likely to work against each of these variants, but there is some chance of a reduced protection for some individuals, but it's still believed the vaccine is pretty much going to protect the vast majority of people who get vaccinated. We are looking at more stringent social distancing, improved testing and tracing measures, um, until the vaccine uptake is substantial and has been shown to be effective in any one given region and that's really what we're looking at for 2021. And I just want to end uh, by saying why genome sequencing is so important to managing this pandemic. Only genome sequencing can identify new variants of concern. We do not know what else is out there in the areas that are not being sequenced. Only genome sequencing can track the spread of a variant within and across national borders. These PCR tests are not really capable of that um, by and large. The identification of new variants is crucial to understanding whether the existing social distancing and, and other measures are sufficient to control a new, more transmissible variant. And it's also key to see whether new variants might escape natural and vaccine-derived immunity. If we've got something that, that might spoil the use of a vaccine, then we have the ability to modify how our vaccines are made and get a new batch of vaccine out before it's too late. And I should point out that the volume of um, coronavirus genome sequencing taking place varies very considerably between nations. The countries doing most of it are the UK. Um, so this was a report from the Washington Times um, at, at the end of December 2020. Uh, the UK has now reached over 200,000 coronavirus genomes. Denmark is also making a big push with over 40,000 genomes. Uh, the US also has um, um, a lot of genome sequencing too. But one thing to think about is how representative a sample of all the positive tests you've got is your genome sequencing. So whilst the US is doing quite a bit of genome sequencing, its case numbers are so high, it's got a very, very low sample rate of its population. And so it's increasingly difficult to track the spread of one particular variant and growth of one particular variant and get your policies in place ahead of that variant coming. Whereas countries like Australia and New Zealand have done an excellent job of sequ sequencing sometimes more than half of all their positive cases and this has allowed these two countries to, to manage their, their pandemic more effectively than other developed nations. So with that, thank you very much for listening. I hope this was useful. Um, please leave comments um, below um, with any questions that, you, that you've got and we'll, we'll try and answer them for you. Thanks a lot. Bye.
Thank you.